Great. Thanks. Okay, folks, welcome. Day two. Um, I'm going to get my stuff set up and then share my screen so we can get started. Okay, can folks give me like a thumbs up or something if you can see the one that's not the speaker view with the notes? Okay, I see some thumbs. That seems great. Um, okay, we're here to talk about climate and militarism. This is day two. Uh, we're gonna talk about some structural stuff. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about surface issues. And we're using this whole metaphor that we'll like revisit in a couple minutes um, to talk about climate and militarism. So we're gonna build off of what we talked about last week, but it's totally not like a prerequisite that you were here last week or anything like that, because this stuff should be applicable no matter what. So I'll just quickly lay out what we're gonna do today. Uh, we're gonna do a quick intro and I'll ask you folks to intro yourselves again. We're gonna revisit this metaphor, this model that we're using to understand the issues. And we're gonna talk about a bunch of different structural issues that tie climate and militarism together, like imperialism. We're gonna talk about US history a bit. We're gonna talk about propaganda, jobs guarantee, start to wrap it up inside the military industrial complex, and then conclude by asking about greening the military versus abolishing it. Uh, and then we'll do sort of a conclusion and review. So that'll all come throughout the two hours and we can start with intros. And before I even intro myself, I just wanna give like uh, an extra special shout out to uh, Elisa who is holding down the chat and doing all sorts of amazing tech support and stuff for us today. Um, she's amazing. So I just wanna make sure I shout her out in advance. So thank you so much for helping out, Elisa. Um, all right, and now I will intro myself quickly. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick, um, or if you do know me, hi, good to see you again. I use he, him pronouns. Um, my prim primary gig is that I'm a uh, PhD student at Tufts. I study computer science and cognitive science. Specifically, I've been researching COVID misinformation and how beliefs spread through populations, They're like very relevant to organizing. But in my free time, uh, I've been organizing with the Sunrise Movement for a couple of years in our Boston hub. So Tufts University is outside Boston in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, on um, Pawtucket and Massachusetts land, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, I've also organized with uh, Massachusetts Peace Action in their Peace and Climate Working Group, which works on the intersections of these issues, and recently getting involved with a youth-led uh, anti-militarism group called the Centers. But beyond, you know, groups Nick, and- there is a request if you could um, put the mic closer or to speak a little louder. Mic closer, okay. Well, let me, let me see what I can do about that. That's a good question. Um, it's, uh, okay, well, let me know if it keeps happening. My, my mic is set to auto adjust, but I can just start talking louder too. But thanks for, thanks for letting me know, Elisa. Um, so beyond, uh, yeah, what groups I'm affiliated with and anything like that, uh, I'm here because I really care about our planet. That's what brought me into this work in the climate space in the first place. Um, I really care about people. So like all my organizing is really centered around building power in people. And I think that should be kind of the point of why we do a lot of this. And I'm here because I wanna help build uh, a safe world, right? There's this idea that I really like from the centers that we have everything we need to be safe already but the systems that we live under create this manufactured lack of safety. Uh, so all we need to do is reorient these systems, right? So that's what I uh, feel passionate to work on. Uh, and I know a lot of you folks have already done this, but I'd love to know who's here. If you put your name and pronouns and why you're, in he or why you're here in the chat, I think it'd be great to sort of intro folks. And I think as well, in a lot of these teaching spaces, we, we did this last week, it's not really often done, but I think it'd be great if 
we could take just the first five minutes to like meet one other person or two other people who are in this teaching. So maybe we could take five minutes. Uh, at least I don't know if the breakouts are possible, but introduce yourself to someone else and maybe just chat for a little bit before we get started. All right, folks, enjoy. So breakout rooms have been opened you might have seen a little window pop up inviting you to join. And if you haven't clicked join, then please do. Thanks, Elisa. Oh, maybe they're just away from their laptops. Okay, I'm going to move. Hey, Lisa, I don't know if um, this may be more relevant to uh, like other, like when we go to a break and stuff. I don't know if you uh, could like pause the recording while we like. Oh, yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome back, folks. Uh, I hope you had a good time in the breakouts. I uh, hope you met someone else and nice to build some bridges across, uh, I'm sure, across the country and between people and such. Uh, so now that we've met each other a little bit, let's keep rolling. I just want to briefly intro what I call some teacher requests. Um, so first I ask that uh, for this teaching, uh, that you be present. Uh, over Zoom, it can be kind of hard. So sometimes it's nice to remove distractions, like you can maybe put your phone in a drawer or you know, close some other windows or tabs. Uh, get a beverage like a cup of tea or a glass of water. Uh, a pen and paper is sometimes helpful if you wanna get that in advance so you don't have to scramble for it if you hear something really cool that you wanna write down, even though this will be recorded. Uh, and it's also nice to just center yourself while we're starting out. A lot of these topics can be pretty heavy and um, these are some of the tougher aspects uh, of learning about the way our world is. So it's nice to start from a place of personally centering. So you know, maybe we can all take a deep breath to begin, just kind of let it out and know that we're all here together to learn. Second, uh, I ask you to participate healthily. So, um, there's a really nice idea that I like. Well, actually, we probably need a lot more of this thinking 
for the next session, but good to just remind. Uh, one idea that I really like is called step up, step back. So we're, when we're in spaces like these that are full of a diverse group of folks, uh, we all have different pieces of our identity, right? And our identities are very intersectional. So as we're participating in this teach-in and future teach-ins, if you hold identities that are typically given power in mainstream society, whether that's being uh, white or male, identifying or masculine, uh, or older or wealthier, maybe feel free to step back and open some space for other folks to participate and talk and, and raise their voices. And conversely, right, if you hold more marginalized identities like being femme or queer or gender nonconforming or young working class or a person of color, indigenous, black, maybe feel free to, I hope the space would be welcoming enough for you to step up uh, so we can sort of undo the power dynamics that exist in mainstream society and make a nice safe space here. So step up, step back. Um, I ask that you take care of yourself and others, right? If anything comes up and it starts to make you feel kind of uh, nervous or panicked or uncomfortable, please feel free to mute me, right? Walk away from the computer, you know, turn your camera off, I won't mind, we won't mind. Uh, I know a lot of this stuff can be pretty difficult, so remember to take care of yourself. And if you see someone else uh, who may be uh, asking for help, you know, uh, we're here to take care of each other as well. Uh, third, uh, the, I put these together from last week, but uh, good eyes and eyes on the prize, what does that mean? Well, we're all here to kind of do the same type of thing. We're all trying to undo these crazy systems of oppression and, and violence that we're working against. So I ask that you keep your eyes on that prize and know that other folks are here to do the same thing. Uh, so we should view each other through good eyes and know that our intentions are in the right place, even if certain uh, things come up in the teaching that kind of rub you the wrong way. Um, that's not to say that harms don't happen. And if they do, you know, feel free to let us know, me or Elisa. Um, but we're all starting from the place of working towards the same goal. And then finally, the comfort, growth, and panic zone. If this type of material is already your like bread and butter, uh, maybe try to go into the growth zone a bit. Maybe instead of just thinking about this stuff intellectually, try to feel it emotionally, right? How does this stuff make you feel? That can be a good way to grow. Uh, but if you end up uh, in the panic zone, like this information is too overwhelming, uh, we want you to ideally come back to this growth zone, right? So maybe you can refer back to take care of yourself and sort of step back and take a pause. So those are some ways to participate healthily today. And then finally, since we're on Zoom, you know, uh, there are some norms that I think are good. So first off, uh, I love when people resonate in the chat. So maybe my folks who know how to resonate, start resonating in the chat. Pretend I said something that totally sticks with you. Throw some pluses in the chat. Let's see what that looks like. Yes. Oh, that resonance. It feels good. It makes me feel like I said something and like other people are seeing me and I feel very heard and seen. We want to create that kind of environment where we're encouraging each other to participate and really seeing other folks. And then additionally stacking, if I ask anyone to, to read something, like maybe read off of a slide or, or ask someone how they feel, I like to do stacking in the chat by putting an asterisk in the chat. So say I said, uh, can someone read this slide for me? Uh, put a star in the chat if you want to read it. And we'll see what that looks like. Yep. So Elisa put a star. And that's kind of how we keep track of, and Ari put a star. That's how we keep track of who wants to speak. And sometimes if folks are speaking a lot, it can be nice to call on someone who hasn't spoken a bunch yet. So resonate and stack over Zoom is great. Please avoid arguments in the chat. I know it can be a little difficult when we're all behind keyboards and screens, um, but you know we're all here for the same purpose, eyes on the prize, view each other through good eyes. That'll help us not get into arguments. Uh, please keep yourself muted. Um, Sometimes it can be difficult when there's sort of background noise going on or 
if you want to say something, maybe put a star in the chat rather than just unmuting yourself and saying it so we can kind of keep track of everything. And um, if, if necessary, Elisa may be muting people too, just if there's noise that we want to turn off. Uh, please keep your video on if possible. I know there's a lot of bandwidth issues and stuff that's totally understandable. Um, but if you can keep your video on, it's nice just so we can see faces and have kind of a community feel in the Zoom. And then finally, uh, please save your questions until the end. I'll do some like Q&A afterwards and um, that'll kind of help us flow through the content because uh, even though I said we had a lot last week, I feel like we have even more this week. So uh, that will not be a trend that continues. We're gonna make it different next time, but uh, we wanna kind of keep rolling. So thanks for bearing with me for the teacher requests uh, because this is part two of four. We're gonna get into it today. Last time we talked about surface, this time we're talking about structure. And then there are two more sessions left uh, for the next two weeks where we'll talk about some roots of these problems and how to change them. But today we're gonna to talk about structure. And just off the top, I wanna to throw out a content warning that we're gonna talk about things like violence, oppression, there are some in this one, there are some explicit uh, quotes that talk about violence against indigenous people that is actually physical violence. Um, so if anything comes up, um, something that helps me when I'm getting triggered by something is uh, this, that's why I keep a glass of water around so I can kind of sip on it. And again, I uh, encourage you to, you know, you can take your headphones out, mute me, turn your camera off. Um, your health and safety is much more important than you know absorbing this content. So I just want to throw out in advance that there are a lot of heavy topics that will come up today. And if I uh, didn't adequately warn about something, um, please let me know afterwards because I want to make sure the content warning is inclusive of all things that may be um, in inducing uh, bad feels for people. Uh, and one last thing, actually there's two last things before we get started, I wanted to do a land acknowledgement. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about history of indigenous genocide today. So um, I think Elisa will put in the chat this link to this website, native-land.ca. And maybe uh, after this goes in the chat, go to that website, plug in where you are and throw back in the chat whose land you're calling in from. I'm calling in from Pawtucket and Massachusetts land over here in West Somerville, outside Boston in Massachusetts. And um, while you all are doing that, I'll just continue with sort of a longer land acknowledgement about the land that I'm occupying. Uh, so the native land around me in Massachusetts, uh, not specifically where I am, but a little farther uh, east and, and north, uh, are, is the land of uh, Algonquin speaking tribes, including uh, a couple divisions of the Wampanoag tribe. There are two federally recognized Wampanoag tribes in Massachusetts today, the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head and the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, so a handful of years ago to pretty recently, uh, the Mashpee Wampanoags around here in Massachusetts were facing a really awful legal battle where the Federal Department of the Interior uh, on September 7th in 2018 refused to reaffirm the federal status of the tribe's reservation. Uh, and this led to some awful consequences for the Mashpee Wampanoag folks. In one of their own statements on their website, they said, you know, while this legal battle was going on between them and the federal government, uh, the tribe's citizens were suffering a massive loss of resources and services. Due to the uncertainty of the trust status uh, for the reservation and millions of dollars in funding were being lost or delayed uh, for their things like their clean water program, for education, for their children and community services that are really critical to the way that they run uh, things on their land. And around this time, there was a huge mobilization of groups in solidarity with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. You may have seen it uh, back a couple of years ago is this hashtag stand with Mashpee, uh, which was pushing for this bill uh, in the Massachusetts House uh, that ended up passing uh, to reaffirm the status of the reservation. 
and it passed on May 15th in 2019 after years of legal uh, struggle, it was a huge win for our indigenous communities here. And this is just one example, right, of how overt or accidental attempts at erasure are perpetuated. You know, we're gonna talk about literally physical indigenous genocide today, but you know, no longer is this happening as much through physical means as much through legal means as well. Uh, and if something is too inconvenient or like unknown to those who have power, right, the prevailing mentality is to relegate uh, folks who we, you know, who the federal government doesn't wanna care about to non-existence rather than actually working at the root issues to question why a system uh, and culture would allow this type of indigenous erasure to exist at all. And I just wanna end with a quote that'll sort of motivate why we talk about this stuff in these spaces. This is a quote from Howard Zinn, whose work I you know, really largely pull from in a lot of the history stuff, who was a professor of political science at BU over here in Boston. This is a quote from his book, A People's History of the United States. Uh, and he's talking about why it's important for us to recognize the indigenous genocide, but move to recognize why it happened. So he says, quote, to emphasize the heroism of Columbus and his successors as navigators and discoverers, and to de-emphasize their genocide is not a technical necessity, but an ideological choice. It serves unwillingly to justify what was done. But my point is not that we must, in telling history, accuse, judge, and condemn Columbus in absentia. It's too late for that. It would be a useless scholarly ex exercise in morality but the easy acceptance of atrocities as deplorable but necessary prices to pay for progress, that is still with us. So uh, that's the end of the quote. By acknowledging the land in this way and learning about the ideas of why these types of atrocities are marked as necessary for progress, uh, those are actually key to learning about the roots that exist at our fight against militarism and against the climate crisis and without acknowledging those roots, we'll really never be able to do the work in the right way. So thanks for bearing with me for the land acknowledgement. Um, and final thing before we dive in, and I, I know I'll have to like really start clicking along a little faster, but just as a heads up, there was a great comment from last week that really stuck to me that um, someone didn't realize that this teach-in would be so focused on US militarism. And you know, I didn't realize that that would have been a good thing to advertise upfront. Uh, and I should have said that, so I apologize. This series is really heavily focused on a lot of aspects of US militarism. And I just wanna say why I think that's uh, an important thing for a lot of the work that I'm involved in and a lot of folks here I think are involved in is you know, because the US is such a hegemonic power around the world, and a lot of us do live in the US. Uh, it's this global empire, right, that the things that happen in the US have an outsized impact on the world and set a lot of precedents for the way that other nations interact around the world. So I think by focusing on the United States, we're actually fighting the fight that will end up making fights easier for other people around the world. Um, but I do definitely acknowledge that I should have said um, up front that this is a very much more US centric. Um, and today is no exception. We're gonna talk about specifically US imperialism in history. So thanks for shouting that out. I really appreciate that. And I hope uh, we can keep that in mind as we go forward. Okay, let's get going. So let's quickly revisit this tree model that we talked about last time. So we're talking about climate and militarism. Right, and I articulated this metaphor that really helps me that it's nice to think about these issues uh, in the metaphor of a tree, right? These issues are like the culmination of something that has grown under certain conditions, right? Taken deep root in the soil, grown like large and strong and has all sorts of structures, a thick trunk and branches, and then gives rise to things at the top the leaves that we all see and are typically focused on. So we're gonna continue with this metaphor uh, for climate and militarism. Last week, we talked about the leaves, right? The military budget, we talked about emissions, environmental justice and pollution, migration and conflict. 
And today we're going to get at the trunk and the branches. So we're going to talk about the structure of this climate and militarism tree. But first I want to say what even is a structural issue? I feel like sometimes we use the term, the, the term structural a lot, but it's kind of hard to understand what we mean. So I just want to motivate how we're going to think about the structure of this tree for this teaching. Uh, so when we think about an actual tree, we can start from there. What makes up the structure of the tree, right? Well, we have things like branches that hold up the leaves, right? The trunk grows thick to balance and hold up the branches and make the tree stable. And we have a you know, large network of roots that hold the tree in place. These are the sort of macro level, acknowledging that there are micro level, but macro level structures that we see in a tree. And even beyond the actual physical embodiment of these structures, we can also ask what do these structures allow to happen? So this is kind of a more interesting point that'll, that'll get us to a systemic picture. Uh, the branches aren't just structures, but they also transfer nutrients, right? To and from the leaves. Uh, the trunk isn't just a thick supporting structure, but it also transports things up to the branches, back down to the roots, and the roots right draw up resources from the ground and share them even between other trees, right? So this culmination, all I did right now is I, I just morphed this tree into a diagram. Uh, the culmination of structure and the things that structure allow to happen, you can think of them as functions, uh, make up kind of a neat way to think about a system. Right, so I converted all the leaves and stuff to boxes that will be our structures and the branches are structures. But also these arrows represent right, the transfer of things like nutrients up from the ground and to the leaves and back down. And in reality, I think all these arrows should have two directions on them, but um, you know, I'm not a ar ar arborist, botanist, I guess. Um, so, uh, focus your eyes on the tree diagram on the left, and I'm just going to switch something really fast. So, okay, what changed? All I did was I replaced the sort of general idea of like leaves and branches and trunk with what we're talking about. So remember last week we talked about the leaves of climate and militarism as the missions, environmental justice, pollution, migration, conflict, and the budget. Um, and I'll just spill the beans that a trunk that sort of supports all this uh, is this society that we live in that's built around white supremacist heteropatriarchal capitalism. And today we're going to try to get at the branches, right? We're talking about structures. So we're going to say, what are the branches um, that hold up this whole thing? And this is a way to think about a system, right? It's the combination of structures and the processes between them. So this is also true of the climate crisis, right? The climate crisis is the result of a system. And this is going to be a very important point for what we talk about all throughout today. So maybe in the chat, throw down some examples of other things that feed into the climate crisis. You know, I feel like a lot of the rhetoric gets only at emissions, but what other things lead to the climate crisis? I'd be so curious to hear. I'll read some out as we put them in. Greed, absolutely. Domination over nature, deforestation and agribusiness. Yes, colonialism, absolutely. These are all great ones. Maybe like uh, one more. Patriarchy, capitalism. Yes, okay, so you all are getting the idea, right? So the climate crisis, right, when it's reduced just to this issue of emissions, it is really not doing justice to the complexity that leads to the crisis in itself, right? So I'll change the diagram one more time, right? We can even argue that all these things that we talked about last time, like emissions, environmental justice, conflict, the budget, pollution, migration, these are things that lead to the climate crisis, right? The climate crisis is a symptom of a very, very complex structure of society that we've built over time. And it's important to note, these are not the only things that lead to the climate crisis, but It'll serve our purposes to know that many, many different things uh, do lead to the climate crisis. And we're gonna fill in those question marks of what 
structures even lead to these things that lead to the climate crisis. So we're getting very recursive. We're doing some inception today. And the problems that we looked at last time, just like I said, are manifestations of the structures that underlie them and the rules they follow. So to dig to these structures, we can get to some answers by asking why questions. These are some of my favorite types of questions because they really reveal what's going on underneath. Uh, so maybe we can start with one question. I'll ask of you all, let's just practice asking some why questions. First off, tell me in the chat, why uh, is the Department of Defense the largest institutional polluter in the world? What do you all think? Anyone who was here last week, feel free to put, the, put some answers in the chat. Why is the Department of Defense the largest institutional polluter in the world? Imperialism. Yes, great answer. Let's see what else folks say. That's even like a second level answer. That's really good. It needs a lot of energy. Yes, absolutely. It needs a ton of energy. The mafia principle. Mm, yes, hawkish imperialist priorities funnel resources to the DOD. Absolutely. Carbon intensive, massive size, forces of destruction, waste. Yes. So these are all great answers, right? And these why questions work in an awesome way that they can even like be recursive and, and answer uh, or generate new questions from uh, the first answers. So even if you said, well, the DOD is the largest polluter because they fly lots of planes and you know, they need a lot of energy, then you can even ask why again. Well, why do they fly lots of planes? Why do they need a lot of energy? Uh, and then you start to get into the answers like, Oh, to you know, maintain dominance, right? To bomb other countries, to maintain imperialism and stuff like this. So these why questions are gonna help us sort of motivate um, the structures that we are gonna look at today. And we'll skip over the other why question I was gonna ask because I think those answers were really good. So keep all this in mind when we're talking about sort of uh, structures and systems today. Uh, we're going to keep that diagram type of thing going throughout the rest of the day. And that brings us to our first topic, imperialism and history. So we can try to figure out at the beginning what the role, uh, what role has militarism played in the systemic picture by looking at the history of U.S. militarism and how it's been used to maintain control domestically and abroad. And I really just want to start out by saying up front that the U.S. has a long history of directly or indirectly using military intervention to serve its economic interests. And these economic interests have often included extracting resources from Native people's land and then leaving environmental and human devastation behind. This is a quote from Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz from an Indigenous People's History of the U.S., Actually, can someone read this quote out for me? Put a star in the chat if you can read this quote. Any takers? Yeah, Mary Ellen, could you read this for us? <clears throat> the history of the US is a history of settler colonialism, the founding of a state based on the ideology of white supremacy, the widespread practice of African slavery, and a policy of genocide and land theft. And that Thank is from much. an indigenous people's history of the US. Thanks so much, Mary Ellen. Yeah, so this starts the idea that our history in the US literally is a history of settler colonialism. And these things are our history. They're not blemishes in our history, they are our history, right? So there's another good quote that continues this. Can someone else read this? Maybe if we could have another star in the chat. Someone who wants to read this one. Jennifer, go for it. Settler colonialism as an institution or system requires violence or the threat of violence to attain its goals. People do not hand over their land, resources, children, and futures without a fight, and that fight is met with violence. In employing the force necessary to accomplish its expansionist goals, a colonizing regime institutionalizes violence. And that's from Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz in Indigenous People's History of the United States. 
Thanks so much, Jennifer. Yeah, you nailed it. So this starts to continue the idea that this history of settler colonialism requires violence or the threat of violence to get away with robbing people of their land, resources, children, and futures. And when people rise up, that fight is met with violence that ends up becoming institutionalized. So keep this in mind uh, as we go through this timeline of uh, events throughout US history that I made. Um, the quote is at the top, part of the quote is at the top. This is the thing that'll tie everything together. So if you forget why we're talking about any of this, uh, just look back at that quote. So I just wanna kind of in a nutshell, run through some US history that motivates this. Um, and we can start all the way back in 1619, right? Starting back at indigenous genocide and slavery, it's all motivated by racial capitalism, right? This colonizing project. But it continues into the Revolutionary War. Right? There's a reading of the war that we typically don't hear that was basically people who already had power just wanted to consolidate it, right? They didn't want to be under the yoke of England and they incited the war to basically uh, use regular people's labor uh, to gain more resources for themselves. And uh, thus begins, uh, from what becomes called the United States, thus begins a long history of uh, inciting wars and uh, justifying wars and violence to maintain resources. So again, this is not a comprehensive list, but some notable incidents is in 1836, the Mexican-American War. Right, This was a war that was entirely provoked by the United States who wanted to expand land for industry, for more resources. Uh, the US literally built a fort uh, on the Rio Grande in Mexican territory to provoke Mexico to protect themselves and fire back. And then this was used as a pretext to start a war with Mexico and gain a ton of territory that now includes uh, California, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, and Texas. And this was entirely motivated by capitalist expansionist intentions. There is a quote from, at the time, from uh, a journal called the Illinois State Register, which was talking about California, uh, that was saying of California, quote, myriads of enterprising Americans would flock to its rich and inviting prairies. The hum of Anglo-American industry would be heard in its valleys. Cities would rise upon its plains and sea coast and the resources and wealth of the nation be increased in an in incalculable degree. So this was entirely for the benefit of private industry and it was sold also by using racist rhetoric, right? Exterminating Mexicans of weaker blood, a war of a superior population. This type of thing just continues uh, over and over throughout our history. We can point to uh, what became called Manifest Destiny, which is actually coined around the late 19th century. This is a quote from Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a Senator of the state that I reside in, what's now called Massachusetts. He was saying, quote, in the interest of our commerce, we should build the Nicaragua Canal. And for the protection of that canal and for the sake of our commercial supremacy in the Pacific, we should control the Hawaiian Islands maintain our influence in Samoa. And when the Nicaraguan canal is built, the island of Cuba will become a necessity. The great nations are rapidly absorbing for their future expansion and their present defense, all the waste places of the earth. So this racist rhetoric of absorbing waste places of the earth and civilizing savage people becomes the history of the expansionist United States. Uh, and this culminates in things like the Spanish-American War, right, where Cuba was fighting for independence from colonial rule by the Spanish. The U.S. offered to help under the guise of, hey, you're trying to do this revolution thing we did. Uh, we'll help you out. Cuba was really happy about it. But then after the Cuban forces won and forced the Spanish forces to surrender, the U.S. didn't allow Cuba to even sign on the uh, Spanish surrender until this thing called the Platt Amendment was agreed to, which would give the United States the right to intervene for the preservation of Cuban independence, but would also give coaling and naval stations at specified locations to the US. 
the Cuban uh, delegation didn't want to do this. So the US occupied Cuba with its military for three months until they agreed to this amendment. And this type of stuff just continues, right? But notably, this also manifests in things like the Second World War, right? In our history books, we learn about it as like the US was defending against the spread of fascism right across Europe and across the world and all these, you know, communist scares. But, you know, actually there's a way of reading it that uh, there were valuable resource interests in the Pacific Southwest that were threatened by Japanese imperialism uh, that were, you know, occupied and controlled by countries like France. So perceiving this threat to things like tin and rubber resources, the US imposed a devastating scrap iron and oil embargo on Japan in what some historians argue was a method to provoke an attack on Pearl Harbor. And then the Second World War was sold to the US population through awful anti-Japanese racism. If you look at the propaganda posters and films back from that period, they're disgusting, right? But this was the attitude of the nation to sell violence to the population in order to control resources. And then after the Second World War, you get you know, the period of US interventions across the world as they're trying to maintain global hegemony, right after emerging as a power. So you have things like the coups in South and Latin America. This is just one in Guatemala. After a democratically elected president was elected, uh, President Arbenz, he wanted to give a lot of land which was concentrated in the hands of a very few, 2% of landowner owners own 72% of arable land in Guatemala. He wanted to give it back to the people, right? Uh, and offered the company that controlled it, a US incorporated company, United Fruit Company, uh, one in $1.2 million, which was a figure their tax uh, accountants actually gave to our Benz. He wanted to compensate the company for it. They said, absolutely not. And then the Secretary of State at the time, John Dulles, and CIA Director Alan Dulles, who were brothers, convinced President Eisenhower to overthrow President Arbenz. And notably, they were both former partners of United Fruit's main law firm. And this led to decades of a devastating uh, right-wing terror regime in Guatemala that was simply there to serve the interests of companies like the United Fruit Company and make things accessible to the U.S. And that was not the only story, right? You get the same thing in Iran, right? When their prime minister Mossadegh wanted to nationalize oil, which is absolutely their right because it's their resource. The US and British CIA and MI6 coordinated a coup to overthrow him. This happened in Iraq, right? Where uh, after overthrowing their monarchy, uh, General Qasim, who is the new, I think, uh, leader, uh, maybe prime minister of Iraq, uh, wanted to implement a whole series of reforms that would uh, include taking back the resources that the um, sympathetic monarchy used to hoard and give to Western powers uh, to generate money for their own people. And when this started to happen, the U.S. pushed narratives that Qasim was a Soviet puppet and then backed this opposition party to lead a coup to overthrow Qasim, who was murdered on national radio and shown on national television. And notably, the Ba'ath Party, the party that the U.S. and, and Britain backed, uh, a notable leader in the Ba'ath Party was Saddam Hussein, who ended up, again, having a reign of terror in Iraq. But as long as it worked out for U.S. interests, we were happy to look the other way. This happened in Vietnam, right? Vietnam was fighting a war against French colonial rule that the U.S. was giving funding to France. Uh, and then after they won their war of independence against France, and we're gonna have elections across a unified Vietnam, the US installed a government in South Vietnam to stop elections. And then again, this is the same thing that keeps happening. The US fabricated an attack on a warship to, multi uh, to motivate an incident to declare war on Vietnam and protect resource interests because France was happy to share resources with the US. There's also this, you know, anti-communist sort of domino theory that was going around at the time. So this is also, you know, sold as a war against communism it was really to protect resources. And importantly, this didn't just happen abroad. This type of stuff happens domestically too. So in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s, as social movements like the Black Power Movement were really gaining 
a lot of notoriety and, and really showing people that there could be a different way to live, the US government feared things like what they called a black messiah rising up and overthrowing what they call stability, which is just basically a racist society. Uh, and the FBI through this program called COINTELPRO, which is short for counterintelligence program, uh, spied on and harassed civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, the Black Panther Party. Uh, they had a hand, the FBI had a hand in killing Malcolm X and Black Panther leader Fred Hampton uh, because they were afraid of uh, you know, something threatening their existing power. They also targeted the New Left Movement, anti-Vietnam organizers, and environmental organizers. So suffice to say, I mean, these are not the only examples, but there's even a lot more that continues after that. Right? We get stuff like the Gulf War, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria giving aid to Saudi Arabia for the war in Yemen. And there's also been domestic militarism as recent as the Nodapo protests and last summer during Freedom Summer. These incursions uh, that the US, like these wars that the US has waged have caused enormous political instability and violence both at home and around the world. So when we talk about things last time like migration, that is literally fueled by this imperialist regime uh, that just wages wars and orchestrates coups uh, for the sake of controlling resources, right? The military and the police are always present to enforce a regime of extracting resources from people and the planet. And whenever dissent arises, militarized forces are used to protect wealthy, elite interests. And this is absolutely true of the climate fight. And we are bound to see more of it in the future. Okay, let's take a breath. So that was a lot of info. Let's process a little bit about it. Um, so let's do some breakouts really quickly, maybe just for five minutes, Elisa, um, where just let's just share with your breakout partner in pairs or trios what, if anything, stood out to you about that history? And feel free not to you know, get caught up with the details, but just how do you even feel right now? And yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Five minutes are very short, Nick. Oh, I know, I apologize. We gotta, we gotta clip through stuff, so hopefully, uh, it leaves you wanting so much more that you can find a discussion partner afterwards. And that can be part of like a good community organizing activity. That would be kind of rad. Um, okay, folks, welcome back. Yeah, I apologize. I know five minutes is quick. We just have so much to talk about, so many fuels to bring up. Um, so I hope, I hope that you had some good discussions. So just to conclude, um, suffice to say, our history is one entirely tied to militarism, whether we knew it or not. Right? Violence literally defines our culture. And the US military, including through covert operations, has been systematically used to protect corporate interests or to expand their power. The climate crisis has revealed and will continue to reveal how US militarism will serve fossil fuel or armed lifeboat interests, armed lifeboat lifeboat being the thing we talked about last time where in response to <clears throat> an unequal society, those who have a lot will choose and have been choosing to put them, to enclose themselves in a safe place and keep other people out uh, and keep everyone else to drown. So, all right, here's our diagrams, right? So I just kind of cleaned it up into, you know, we're gonna fill in the middle space with the branches and we have our leaves leading to the climate crisis fueled by the military. And what did we fill in this time? Well, we have the US government and corporations, right? Working in tandem uh, in pursuit of more power or more profits, using the military to wage wars, occupation, coup and domestic terror, which all feed into the climate crisis. Okay. Topic two, so we can ask the question after all of this, um, how does the government, military and corporations get away with all of this? So just as a quick temperature check 
in the chat. How many people, just throw like a one in the chat if you've ever learned about this in school or a zero if you haven't or didn't. Let's see, one, zero, one. Good for you, Deb. Zero, 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 zero. One, go Elisa. Zero, 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 two. That's an interesting one. One, one. So a mix, but I will certainly say for uh, myself, uh, that was a zero. I did not learn about this in school. And if I did, maybe I just forgot. But it certainly wasn't emphasized in the way that I think is really important to emphasize as we're going, uh, as we're trying to undo these systems, right? But also like as these uh, physical means of violence have gone on throughout history, there's been an equally long history of using propaganda, which I would argue is somewhat of an ideological or intellectual violence to coerce people into supporting what's going on, right? So I just took the timeline and I swapped out the actual acts with how people convinced everyone to go along with it with things like Manifest Destiny, right? There was revolutionary war propaganda in the Mexican-American War, this idea that Mexico attacked us and the racism of, you know, we're gonna civilize their backwards people. In between, we had stuff like Jim Crow, right, which justified repressing newly emancipated black slaves by depicting them as violent and, and, and brutish and worth repressing. Uh, and then there's all of this expansionist rhetoric that corporations put in newspapers, right, anti-Japanese propaganda in World War II. Then we get into all the Cold War propaganda, et cetera, et cetera. We have a super long history of the government and corporations convincing people to go along with these ventures. And a framework that I like uh, that I think is important to recognize is that propaganda typically consists of a simple narrative with fear of some outgroup and some greater purpose to be derived from being in the in-group that's fighting back. So uh, just as a quick example for Manifest Destiny, this was just you know the very simple narrative of right? It's your divine right to expand. Be afraid of the savage backwards native people, uh, but be like a, a settler who's building this great nation. If this pattern repeats over and over and over and is a very common uh, structure of the narratives used for propaganda. And they're used to justify and sell ideas that would otherwise be unpopular. So in recent times, we've seen this pop up around the war on terror. Right? Be a patriot. Uh, be afraid of terrorism and terrorists. I mean, no one's talking about the actual geopolitics going on. All you need to know is we're saving the world from terror. This, also, this, this narrative of saving the world or democratizing the world is a big one. It comes up all the time from the US. So I'll ask you, what narratives do you all see uh, the propaganda model pumping out these days? I'd be really curious to see what people Oh, there are already some good examples in the chat. War on drugs, absolutely. Yeah, that was one I, I didn't put in, but that's absolutely one. Exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, yes. Good note from Deb, this is a good clarification. Yeah, manifest destiny is not an official term until around the mid 19th century, but historians have sort of retconned it to use it for the earliest indigenous genocides as well. Um, mass incarceration, yes, absolutely. These days, oh yeah, okay. So someone's calling, calling out one that's gonna come up. Fear of socialism, yes. So all this stuff is going on these days. I just took um, a brief series of snippets from major mainstream news journals. Uh, one that I see a lot is, someone said it in the chat, all this stuff about China these days, right? There is article after article after article that the propaganda machine is pumping out these days to try to incite basically what would be a new Cold War with China. So uh, suffice to say, this stuff is still going on, uh, but the government is not the only institution that uses propaganda to buy agreement from the population. There's also a parallel history uh, of this being done from what we call the private sector. Uh, but it's couched in these two words that are really nice ways of saying propaganda, but it's called the public relations industry. So this was actually the modern public relations industry is argued to have been founded 
by this guy named Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Freud, who used Freud's theory of the unconscious mind to manipulate people into doing things for corporations. So he was responsible for recruiting people in England for the First World War. He helped the tobacco industry wage a campaign in the US to make it fashionable for women to smoke. And he also had a hand in helping United Fruit Company overthrow Guatemala's government. So this thing was happening in the private sector, right? This ideology motivated it that the masses, who is us, are ignorant right, and incapable of democratic self-rule. So they have to be guided right, by smart people like Edward Bernays, by enlightened men. And just to tie it back to the fact that this is so ingrained in US history as well, this was the attitude of James Madison, right, one of the so-called founders uh, that he expressed in the Federalist Papers when he was talking about a fear of factionalism. It was really just him being afraid that people, uh, he actually just didn't want people to rule the country, he wanted to rule it. Um, and the public relations industry has gone on to mislead the public, people like us on things like smoking, sugar, diamonds, and importantly for our purposes, climate change. Uh, and while this is going on from the private sector uh, in our modern sort of ecosystem, the media follows along. So there's, this is a great book that I highly recommend reading from Noam Chomsky and Ed Herman called Manufacturing Consent where they showed through a ton of empirical evidence that the US corporate media actually just follows along with these powerful narratives that come from the government and come from private corporations just because they're incentivized to make a profit by free market assumptions. So there is a series of filters that they argued and then showed systematically that a bunch of wars were covered up because certain private interests of the US government always wanted itself to be viewed in a positive light. Right? So this culmination of the government and private companies and the media following along uh, paints a picture that we live honestly in a profoundly undemocratic society, right? one that's dominated by narratives that serve private interests, even when the public opinion may otherwise be opposite. So this actually shows up in a really interesting example that I like to talk about a lot in the climate space. The propaganda machine has affected the fight for a Green New Deal. Uh, there is a really good study done by the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication that showed through a series of polling studies how this propaganda machine turned on to denigrate the Green New Deal. So I'll just go quickly. The Green New Deal in 2018, as it was being rolled out, had super strong bipartisan support, right? 81% of people across party lines on the left supported the Green New Deal including 64% of Republicans supported the Green New Deal. And uh, what they heard about the Green New Deal was this quote that I have on the right. I'll just read the first sentence that a Green New Deal would produce jobs and strengthen America's economy by accelerating the transition from fossil fuels to clean renewable energy. And it goes on to say more, honestly, facts about a Green New Deal. But notably, in 2018, most people had never heard of a Green New Deal, right? 82% had heard nothing at all. Um, and by 2019, a lot more people had heard about it. So this was a follow-up study that was done by the same group, the Program on Climate Change Communication. They showed that in 2019, in April 2019, now only 41%, half uh, of the previous number had not heard about a Green New Deal. So a lot more people had, but they noted that support dropped a ton. Right? And they wanted to ask why. And they actually showed that the group who had heard the most about a Green New Deal in April 2019 was conservative Republicans. Right? If you look at the graph on the left, they went from only 12% having heard about it in 2018 to 71% hearing about it in 2019. And the next biggest rise was in liberal Democrats, which was kind of a head scratcher. They're like, why were conservative Republicans now the ones who have heard the most about a Green New Deal? And they actually, they did, uh, a sort of secondary question that showed strong correlations with how much conservative Republicans heard about the Green New Deal, what entirely depended on how much they watched Fox News, right? Folks who watched it only once a week or less, you know, they went from 11% having heard about it to 54% in 2019. But those who watched Fox a ton went up to 82% of them having heard about it in 2019. And they're also the group whose support dropped the most between those two periods of time. 
And in another interesting study, the group Data for Progress showed uh, in June of 2019 that the words that people started to associate with the Green New Deal were like shockingly split uh, between people who watch Fox News a lot and people who don't. People who watched Fox News uh, would refer to it with words like uh, stupid, destroy, uh, get rid, uh, eliminate, travel, cow, plane, trillion dollars. Right? These are the narratives that have started to pop up to counter a Green New Deal. And it may seem like, you know, kind of hacky and obvious to be like, oh, Fox News is, you know, spinning these, these campaigns against, you know, sort of more progressive things. But this really affects a lot of people. Uh, almost half the country trusts Fox News. And that's a huge part of our um, population. And they're following the playbook of these private interests, right? So this follows the same framework, right? Uh, propaganda framework of be an American, a true American, right? Be afraid of these socialists who want to take away your airplanes and your hamburgers. We're not actually talking about the Green New Deal because its factual description was way too popular, uh, but just be a true American and fight against this. And let's also not forget that the fossil fuel industry simultaneously waged a disinformation and misinformation campaign for decades to cover up climate science. This is a quote from a good report called America Misled. Uh, I'll just read the first and last sentences, but it starts to say, quote, over the past few decades, the fossil fuel industry has subjected the American public to a well-funded, well-orchestrated disinformation campaign about the reality and severity of human-caused climate change and ends by saying the fossil fuel industry's denial and delay tactics come straight out of Big Tobacco's playbook. Remember who started those campaigns to get women smoking in the US? Edward Bernays. It's the same public relations kind of picture, right? So alongside physical violence, there is an expert system of propaganda that was developed first in order to justify war and corporate expansion that exists in the US and is absolutely at work in the climate fight. Right? And this leads to a fundamentally undemocratic system that makes it really hard for us to do our work. So we have to keep this piece of the puzzle in mind when we're uh, you know, advocating for the things we advocate, doing things like our power analyses to see where we have to put pressure. So to return to our system diagram, this is what we had last time, right? We had added the government and corporations and we can add these two boxes of a propaganda system right, that serves the interests of the government and corporations to manufacture the consent of the people. Okay, uh, I realize we're running really short on time. I think we might actually skip the break if that's okay with folks. Um, yeah, let's, you know what? Let's not skip the break. That would be awful. Let's take a break for five minutes. I'll just kind of crunch through the rest of this stuff. Um, we'll come back at 2.25. Um, so mark your, mark your watches. Feel free to stretch, uh, get some water, et cetera. Cool. All right, folks, welcome back. I know that was a short break. Five minutes is much shorter than uh, it seems just by the number. But um, I hope you got some good break, got some water stretched, looked away from the screen. Um, we're going to keep going on the next few topics. I'm going to try to find ways to shorten them a little bit. And someone asked a, a great question in the chat uh, about the slides. They will be sent out uh, after the session to everybody, and like they'll be kept in a Google Doc for forever because I know the slides are pretty dense. Um, so it might be helpful to refer back to them and, and read them a little deeper. But so this is where we concluded, right? We had the system with a propaganda system and we just took a break. So welcome back. Um, we're gonna talk about one last sort of piece of the system and then we're gonna wrap up the system itself and sort of give a name to it. So the last thing I wanna talk about is a jobs guarantee. This is an interesting point that doesn't get talked about as much in the climate or militarism spaces, but I think is absolutely crucial. There are other ways that the US has historically uh, maintained support for the military and its actions. 
Since the founding of the nation, class inequality and financial incentives have been systematically used to encourage participation in the military. This is a snippet from a really old like newspaper or something. And here's the content warning that comes up. This quote is absolutely disgusting. Um, but I just want to read it out to bear witness to the fact that this violence did happen. Um, right at the founding of the nation and as we're building towards what's called the United States, there are things like the Massachusetts legislature, legislature saying in 1755 that the Penobscot Indians, native people, were declared as rebels, enemies, and traitors. And the government was offering bounties for every scalp of a male Indian brought in or scalps of female Indians or male Indians under the age of 12 uh, for a different price. And this type of thing was used to encourage participation in the genocide, right, by the powers that be. This is another quote from Howard Zinn as he's retelling the history of the American Revolution. He says, quote, the military became a place of promise for the poor who might rise in rank, acquire some money and change their social status. But here is the traditional device by which those in charge of any social order mobilize and discipline a recalcitrant population. And remember these things, offering the adventure and rewards of military service to get poor people to fight for a cause they may not clearly see as their own. Revolutionary, uh, Revolutionary America also, uh, you can read the quote later, but the gist of it is that um, even though it was being argued to be a more equitable society, who did the fighting in the war? It was largely poor people, right? And this continues in other wars. In the Mexican-American War, half of General Taylor's army were immigrants, right? Volunteers, not conscripts, lured by money and opportunity for social advancement. Even after uh, the Civil War, right, when slave codes were enacted, uh, white people were basically utilized by the powers that be to uh, forego class solidarity for whiteness uh, and were recruited into the first paid jobs in the colony on slave patrols. And these were the first police forces in the US. So the military for most of US history, including today, has been the only federal jobs guarantee. And we can maybe exempt some periods in the New Deal era. Um, but this has always been true. Right? It sets up a system where poor or disadvantaged people seek military service as a means to advance. And this type of rhetoric has been normalized. Right? We have this narrative in this country that the military provides opportunities right, and discipline and has always been a tool of wealthy expansionists. So history aside, today, nothing has really changed. So I did some digging into reports that the Department of Defense has done on uh, why people or who uh, even to begin wants to recruit or wants to join the military. And this is just one graph from this report that they did in 2017, showing that young people are much more likely to join the military than as they get older, right? 16 year olds were the highest percentage of saying they would definitely be serving in the military or probably, and then it declines over time. And the Department of Defense has layered on this uh, idea of targeting uh, uh, financial incentives with targeting young people. And this has culminated in the top 10 reasons for joining the US military from this report. They're almost all financially motivated, right? To pay for education, uh, to travel. So remember that adventure part of the quote that I said to remember, um, pay or money, right? gain experience, work skills, health and medical benefits. This thing, this, this idea is absolutely known by the military these days. Um, and they say so in uh, reports that are on these types of military sites like the Army Times. This is a quote from this guy, General Frank Muth from 2019 saying, quote, one of the national crises right now is student loans. And you know, 31,000 is about the average you can get out of the Army after four years which is 100% paid for state college anywhere in the United States. And he continues to say that uh, 
you know, in 2019, he was saying, you know, the low unemployment rate in the booming economy has really made dif uh, recruiting difficult, especially when compared to past recruiting pushes during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars that more lined up to a major global recession. So they're saying these things, like it's out there for everyone to see, and this is their strategy. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, this is an email I got as I was making these slides. Uh, I'm in grad school and they literally sent me an email that was like, hey, it's a well-known fact that I'm not going to medical school, but somehow they got this idea. It's a well-known fact that medical school is expensive. You know, the army can help out with this. This was an unsolicited email that I just got in my inbox. So they are up to these types of schemes, right? And you can read it later. It's kind of funny. And I just want to call out that in the climate space, this is in direct opposition to what we're fighting for through a Green New Deal in the form of a jobs guarantee, right? So right now, uh, this is some language from the Sunrise Movement's Good Jobs for All campaign. Right now, there are over 18 million people out of work, and millions more are trying to get by working part-time and underpaid jobs. And the second part of the darkened quote at the bottom it will take millions of people to build a new energy grid, care for older folks, teach children, restore parks and buildings, and uh, serve our communities and build them into happy, happier and healthier communities. This is the type of work that we know needs to be done uh, and that we want to push for through a Green New Deal federal jobs guarantee. But this is being fought against by what already exists as the jobs guarantee as the military. And a jobs guarantee is really popular, right? Across party lines, uh, this had 60, 64% of voters saying this would be a good way to respond to the present economic crisis. So the military being the only federal jobs program has preyed on class inequality to support the agenda of the powerful. And when we think about what types of jobs these are, these are the ones that lead to pollution, extraction, and doing that harm, right? Last week, we talked about the fact that these jobs are not investments, right? We really need to just invest in our communities. And a federal jobs guarantee from a Green New Deal would redirect time and energy to creating a sustainable world. But it stands to harm, directly harm, the interests of a militarized state and economy, and the two will inevitably clash. So this is also part of our organizing challenge. Uh, keep your eyes on the diagram. This is a very subtle addition. I just added a line from the people to the military preying on debt and poverty, right? So this is the last sort of leg of this diagram that I wanted to motivate where there are a lot of intersections between militarism and the climate crisis. Um, and how can we wrap these up? Well, there is some language that already exists. And again, I apologize. I'm gonna go a little faster through these than I think is required to actually get the gist of them. But hopefully this will all still make sense. But this is what's called the military industrial complex, right? This is what we're fighting against. Um, so we've talked about how wars throughout US history have been fought to serve, serve commercial goals. Well. How did the idea of having a huge military that makes a ton of money even begin in our history at all? Well, it has roots in the New Deal. Uh, in the climate space, we talk about the New Deal a lot because we talk about the Green New Deal. And this is a fact that people kind of overlook that I think is actually crucial. So coming out of the depression, the New Deal actually didn't end the economic crisis. You can take a look at this uh, table more closely later, but the unemployment rate does not drop. After the, after the New Deal was passed. It created good regulations and, and a strong baseline, but it actually didn't address the economic problems. What really fixed the economy was the World War II mobilization. And that really employed a ton of people, built the middle class as we know it, or you know, whatever we call it these days. Um, and it made the economy a lot better, right? So why did it help? Well, the US started to export tons of goods, war goods, to allies like Great Britain, France. And after the war, the US was put in a position to dominate the world. Uh, and there were a ton of corporate gains from World War II. And it seeded this idea in the minds of people who held private power, uh, articulated by this guy named Charles E. Wilson, who was the president of GE at the time, General Electric, 
where I used to work saying that, uh, quote, you know, he was so, this is actually from uh, People's History of the U.S. He was so happy about the wartime situation that he suggested a continuing alliance between business and the military for a permanent war economy. And that's what we get after the Second World War. So we roll into the Cold War and get anti-communist propaganda. And this starts to begin the cycle of the military being the dominant uh, budgetary priority in the country. So this is another timeline. And as I advance the slides, there will be like a bunch of examples as how about how the, the budget got larger and larger over time. I'm just gonna kind of do it like as if it was a GIF. So feel free to look back at it. I'm not gonna explain all of them. But we started with aid to people. We kept giving aid, military aid to other countries justified by fighting communism. The budget grew, it grew even bigger. It kept growing and it keeps going up basically is the gist, right? And around this time, you have some figures like President Eisenhower in 61 warning of the danger of a conjunction of an immense military establishment with a large arms industry. He was actually, I don't know if he was the first one, but he was one of the earliest to actually coin the term, the military industrial complex. And he warned against uh, its potential influence on the way the country was going and holding undue amounts of power in the political process. And these days, the military industrial complex has grown even bigger, right? It encompasses the CIA, the NSA, the Pentagon, private contractors, the State Department, media, think tanks, lobbyists, and universities. So this is a huge part of our society that really stands to set priorities and make a ton of money off of uh, basically wasting money on, on creating uh, wars and arms. Uh, again, you know, maybe look at this in more depth later, but you know, we have military contractors who are can, making a ton of profit off of um, manufactured wars, right? Companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, who they don't just make planes, that's just in, they actually make bombs as well. Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, these contractors uh, make a ton of money off of wars and creating you know, what technology for, for killing people. And this becomes a huge priority in our economy. Uh, under neoliberalism, you know, they've only gained more power, but you can see later on that they're actually very wasteful um, and lead to a lot of fraud that like is not talked about a lot. So besides even contractors, right, there's a huge political influence of the military industrial complex. Companies like Boeing and Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin in 2019, each of them spent over $13 million on political lobbying to set up and keep in existence the system that creates a revolving door between the defense industry and the White House. So our current Secretary of State uh, and Secretary of Defense are people who have ties to uh, private contractors, military contractors. And this goes even beyond uh, just weapons manufacturers. This is how pervasive the military industrial complex is in our society. I called this out a little bit last time, but I feel like I have an obligation to do this because these are people in my field. Even companies like Google, and Amazon, and Microsoft are part of the military industrial complex, right? This idea of, you know, what I, part of what I research, artificial intelligence is sold as these consumer friendly devices, right? Things like Siri and the Google Home, and you know, you can talk to your phone and here's a robot that looks nice. But all of these uh, artificial intelligence projects were actually begun for military purposes, right? In the research world, vision, computer vision was designed to detect ships and spot resources of interest. Speech recognition, which lets you talk to Siri, right, was uh, made for surveillance and voice controlled aircraft. Robotics, autonomous weapons, right? And this has influences in my field in the university research space where people who could be spending time uh, researching solutions to the actual crises that face us 
in things like the climate crisis actually end up having to sculpt their research to serve a military agenda. And I just want to plug a great book on this topic by a good friend, Yarden Katz, is called Artificial Whiteness, which relays this history of artificial intelligence always serving military interests. No matter how hard or you know, what excuses people come up with in academia to say, oh, I'm not actually doing military research. Well, they are. So it even begs questions like, are these consumer products really worth it? Given that Amazon makes services for ICE, Google works with the Pentagon and Microsoft also works with ICE. Uh, this is just one field, but this is how expansive the military industrial complex is, right? It pervades even these supposedly friendly companies because it makes them a ton of money. So, okay, that, I know that was a lot, but what does this even mean for the climate crisis, right? Military technology will never address the climate crisis. It will only worsen it, right? We can't be spending money on weapons and things like AI as a solution to the climate crisis. Those are not solutions, right? They're just gonna make it worse. Money and time are wasted and priorities become skewed by the military industrial complex. And in a kind of scary way, uh, the existence of this system uh, might actually profit off of climate conflicts, right? There are, I didn't link them, but there are articles where these companies say, hey, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of conflict in the future. Maybe we should like make new security systems and stuff like that. This is real, right? A sustainable economy would just not even allow for the existence of a military industrial complex. And uh, I think as like one final point, uh, I just wanna call out that young people who are often these days at the forefront of fighting these climate fights are totally getting screwed over by things like the military industrial complex, right? When contractors offer high salaries to students with debt, just like the military is doing, it makes it difficult for socially beneficial industries to attract people to work for them. Uh, and then entire industries and research disciplines end up in the service of this weaponized empire, right? When we would rather have jobs working on the real issues. And then all this spending increases deficit and makes debt that can either be paid for by cutting social programs or by just pushing this debt onto us young people and future generations. So we're definitely running out of time, but I'd be curious to hear if folks have feelings of how has this permanent war economy affected your life and the choices you've been forced to make? Maybe just put some in the chat and I'll read a couple out. Wow. People are putting all sorts of stuff in the chat. Holy moly. This is kind of a bigger question, but let's see what Elisa wrote. Tough conversations with a couple of friends. Yeah, oh, that resonates really hard with me. Yeah, I've had those tough conversations as well. Really difficult. Let's see, what was this? Fear of an enemy is an effective tool for leveraging money from the public coffers. That's totally true. That affects all of our lives, right? Someone being a war resistor during Vietnam. <laughs> Draft call was early and I was declared a security risk. Wow, that's how this stuff affects our lives, right? Someone saying actively need to analyze research contracts to see if they can repurpose my work for defense. That's totally real, right? So please keep them coming in the chat as you're thinking of these things. Um, but suffice to say this stuff affects all of us, right? So to conclude, right, this sympathetic relationship between the military and private industry has perpetuated these manufactured threats as justifications for profiting off of all of this violence and these systems that we laid out before. And this is gonna be our next topic, but a just transition would totally eliminate these systems. But right now they're so entrenched politically and ideologically that uh, we have to address them as part of the climate fight and vice versa. And the fact that these uh, private powers stand to profit off of climate conflict 
is just a huge thing that like we really need to incorporate into our analysis. So our diagram does not change that much. All that I added was a box around everything and said, this is the military industrial complex. So, okay, our last thing, um, because we have 14 minutes left is let's just end by asking the question, okay, and we motivated this last time, can we green the military or should we abolish it? So let's do a thought experiment, right? Let's imagine that the US military entirely cleans up, right? They use only renewable energy. They restore the toxic sites that they created. Are we good? Maybe put in the chat, would there still be problems that exist even if the military was running on renewables and cleaned up all their stuff? What are some issues that would still exist? What do folks think? I know we're getting to the end. <laughs> Sustainable war fighting is an oxymoron. Yeah, that's a good one. Violence still persists. That's absolutely true. Dominance still exists. Yes. International co co uh, cooperation is undermined, but we uh, would get competition instead. We need a strategy that changes the paradigm, not just tweaking the edges. Yes. No, still not good. We still have capitalism. Yes. <laughs> Someone's like, yeah, just get rid of it. Absolutely. So, you know, this is, this is the rhetoric that goes around. Like even Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren's uh, presidential campaign was arguing for greening the military, right? They have this idea of what they call the great green fleet to fix all these problems. But really, you know, given this complex system that we laid out, uh, I highlighted emissions, right? If we just get rid of emissions, everything else is still there. Right? This is like laughably obvious after you lay everything out. You know, there will be new environmental justice hazards, right? There will be new pollution. The budget will still skew priorities. There will still be conflict. It will still lead to migrations, right? All this stuff is still in place. And uh, does this fix the climate crisis? No, because the climate crisis is a complex system, symptom of an interconnected system. So this is just tying up this idea that we've kind of been laying out all throughout today that, you know, there are a lot of systems at play that we need to address in order to actually get it right and not keep perpetuating the crisis. So we're going to skip over this thing in the chat, Lisa, but um, this is a good diagram that I wanted to wrap up with. This comes from movement generation. I know I've used the words just transition a lot throughout the teaching, both last week and today. Uh, they lay out this idea that we need to transition our systems in order to achieve true climate justice. The left side, I'm hiding the right side, but the left side of this diagram that we see right now shows that we right now live in an extractive economy, right? With this worldview that's informed by consumerism and colonialism, and also as we showed through propaganda, right? That exists to justify resource extraction digging, burning, dumping, that when people get upset about it, as they would, right? People don't hand over their land, resources, children, future without a fight. Then we have militarism as a form of governance, right? It's not like we actually have a democratic system or else things would be entirely different. And this, all of this plus an exploitative manner of working, which we didn't as much talk about, but the military certainly does exploit poor people and, and uh, working people. And there's also a whole other thing of how they uh, purposely target BIPOC folks as well and young people uh, is all in the service of the enclosure of wealth and power, maintaining these systems of power that we talked about before. So climate justice and a green military are fundamentally philosophically at odds the mindsets of militarism that allow for the exploitation abroad and at home have led to and will perpetuate the climate crisis. Even if the military was totally sustainable, these crises of extraction and repression and violent pursuit of power 
power and profit would be intact. So when we're thinking about what we need to do with our organizing, we need a systems change, right? We have to address these structures of the tree that we've been talking about. The right side of this diagram shows if we're going to transition to what they call a living economy, right, with a worldview that's premised on caring and sacredness, where we treat resources as regenerative and we are in right relation with people and planet, when our governance was, is actually through deep democracy and we work cooperatively instead of competitively and exploitatively, all for the purpose of ecological and social well-being, that's the world we want to get to. And to get there, we have to address these systems of militarism and climate that are so intertwined that we talked about today. So this is a, I, I really encourage folks to check out Movement Generation even more if you're curious on thinking about systems change. So I'll leave it there because I think the vision of the living economy is so amazing that that's like a nice positive note to leave off on. And I'll just conclude and go over what we uh, talked about today. To wrap up, right, we talked about imperialism, right, our long history of settler colonialism and racial capitalism, making the military the de facto enforcer for extraction. Uh, and the military existing to protect corporate interests, leading to the armed lifeboat and other ideologies. How do they do it? Right, with propaganda. There have always been systematic means developed to convince people to support violence, extraction, and private interests. And the same thing has justified fossil fuel extraction and halted progress on things like a Green New Deal, covered up climate truths. How else do they do it? They prey right on working people and poor people to enlist in the military. As the only general, <laughs> federal jobs program, it directly stands in the way of the economy that we want to build through things like a Green New Deal and a jobs guarantee that would give work that actually benefits communities. Young people are targeted because of student debt and high tuition. And this all culminates right in the military industrial complex this relationship between private powers and government that literally manufactures problems to profit off of violence, uh, that a just transition would require the complete elimination of it. Uh, and that the priorities of our nation are set accordingly, right? Tons of energy and money and thought ends up dedicated to the wrong problems, right? So faced with the choice of, do we green the military or do we abolish it? Uh, given that the mentalities of extraction at home and abroad have led to and will perpetuate the climate crisis, uh, even if the military, you know, we just said this, even if the military was 100% fueled by renewables and non-polluting, it would still fundamentally exist to enforce extraction for private gain. Greening the military, not an option. So in final conclusion, these are the systems right, that perpetuate the problems we learned about in the last session. Militarism is a fundamental part of the system that has led to the climate crisis and part of what makes it so hard to address, right? You can also argue, right, uh, even if we uh, got rid of almost everything except, you know, the propaganda system or something, that is an essential system that makes the climate crisis hard to address. Right? We wouldn't have the same crisis without it. And a just transition would require a systems change. And the military cannot be left out of that transition. We did it, folks. We filled in the branches and trunk of our tree. We are building out this whole picture of the connections between climate and militarism. And next week, we will talk about the ideological roots, and I promise next week will not be so information heavy. We're actually gonna feel a lot next week and we're gonna talk with each other a lot more because I find that when we're talking about these ideologies that are so deeply internalized, this is like work that we do individually and, and in community to really undo these internalized oppressive mindsets that really led to the growth and fuel this tree in the first place. So I'll just shout out a big thank you 
um, for sticking along. And if you were here last week and coming back, thanks for coming back. If you're new, thanks for being new. Uh, we're gonna have our third session next week, from one to three, same time, same link. If you wanna sign up or share this with other folks who you think may be interested, uh, hop onto that bit.ly. I'll share it back out in the emails. And of course this recording will be shared back with my slides and all the links and resources as well. And I'll stick around for like maybe 15 minutes or so, so we can do some Q and A. So I'll stop my share and Elisa, Feel free to stop the recording as well.